All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marc Andre Pigeon, and I am the director of the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. Um, this is our annual lecture in honour of the late, great Ian McPherson. I'm going to tell you a bit about Ian in just a minute, um, but a, a couple of things I want to underline. First of all, this is a hybrid event, our first ever hybrid event, so if you see me looking a little bit confused, it's because I'm trying to figure out <laughs> where the camera is and where the screen is. Um, but we're going to get this straightened out, and I think it'll work well. Um, and thank you for those, of us, for those of you who are joining us from the internet. Now today I want to kind of do things in a little bit of reverse order for introduction purposes. And I'm going to put our land acknowledgement near the end. And I think, I hope you'll see why that makes sense in just a minute. Um, I want to start with a less than maybe intuitive place to kick off this talk by noting that yesterday um, U.S. government officials told us that scientists had, some scientists in the United States, and I'm going to quote the Globe and Mail here, had achieved a major scientific breakthrough in the decades-long quest to harness fusion, and that is the energy that powers the sun and the stars. Now, essentially, what I, what I understand from this is the scientists have figured out a way to generate a net energy gain, sort of like one plus one equals three. Now, as I reflected on this important breakthrough, I couldn't help but think that when we work together, when we cooperate, um, the whole also becomes greater than the parts. You know, just like fusion research is showing us we can get this net energy gain, working together also kind of generates something similar. It's a bit like we could call it human fusion. Um, and for human fusion to take place, it usually has to start with someone has the drive and the energy to step up and pull the pieces, the humans, together. And our McPherson lecturer today, Josh Campbell, is that kind of person. He's that catalyst that, that sparks that human fusion. And just to give you an example of the kinds of work Josh has done that speak to that potential, um, him and his partner actively working to support a community fridge in their neighborhood of, I'm forgetting the Heritage, Heritage neighborhood in Regina. Um, Josh was the kind of mover and shaker behind Regina's Renewable Energy Cooperative, an area of great interest to myself. Um, he has led the charge to build a, a permaculture garden at the high school where he teaches. Um, he runs a, a podcast on all manner of topics. You can maybe probe him about that later on. Um, he's produced an award-winning documentary on the mistreatment of indigenous peoples in the Western Sahara by Morocco. Uh, and, and interestingly, drew a line in that documentary back to Saskatchewan. And now today, we're going to hear how Josh is reorienting his career his, as a podcaster, as a high school teacher, as a documentary filmmaker, with this vision of building an agrarian university rooted in permaculture, this idea of permaculture, and he'll explain what that is, distributism and cooperative values and principles. Uh, and these, are, these ideas are in some ways as much a part of the Saskatchewan landscape as the water, land, and trees, this idea of working together. Um, so as you can see, unlike so many of us in the university world, um, and I'm, I'm as guilty as the next, Josh puts ideas into action. I don't say this in any way to diminish the work we do in the university. In fact, Josh and I um, talk semi-regularly semi about the world of ideas and their applications to the real world. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say Josh takes inspiration from ideas um, for his actions. But, but even the best academic paper, even the best academic, really only gets us halfway, if we're lucky, to a better world. We need people like Josh, social entrepreneurs, to get us the rest of the way. And that's something that Ian McPherson, whose name graces this talk, was all about. He understood and admired and was one of the people that, are, that Josh exemplifies. Uh, I remember walking into a, a credit union office in Vancouver, British Columbia, and there was Ian McPherson's picture. He was the former chair of Central One, which is a second tier entity that's owned by credit unions in that provinces. Um, and people like Ian, like Josh, they're the kind of people that, that take an idea and breathe it into life fashioning the bones, the muscles, the sinews that give us the institutions that shape our world and our day-to-day -day behavior. I think in, in Ian's mind, the best of those institutions were cooperatives, um, these democratically owned businesses that specialize in the business of making one plus one equals three. Now, in the last few years of his life, um, Ian McPherson spent a lot of time researching and studying and writing about cooperatives and indigenous communities. Um, he saw these as, a, as another place where that kind of one plus one magic kind of happens. 
Um, he also recognized there was some shared understandings and a set of values that committed to kind of intergenerational thinking past yourself into the next generation and prioritizing community ahead of profit. Now that's not to say that, and I think Ian's work kind of shows this, that cooperatives were somehow free of, of the relationship, that, uh, the racism that still tarnishes our relationship with indigenous communities um, that are this land's original inhabitants. And that's why I think it's important that we recognize that we here in Saskatoon and all of you out there are settlers on this land. In our case, it's Treaty 6 territory, home of the Cree, the Dene, the Blackfoot, the Soto, Nakoto, Nakoto, Nakota Sioux, and the Métis. I think it's also why, when we think about this, we have to remember to be good neighbors to one another, good stewards of this land, and good ancestors to all our children. And I think Josh's talk is very much in that spirit, and I think you're going to see that in a minute. Now, before I turn things over to Josh, just a few brief comments on how things are going to proceed. Josh is going to talk, what, 30, 40 minutes, roughly, Josh? Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, <laughs> maybe a little more. Um, after the presentation, we're going to open things up for questions. If you're online, like I said a moment ago, um, we ask you to keep your, your video off, your, your microphone muted. Uh, once we get to the Q&A portion, you can put the uh, video back on uh, and, and then s indicate whether you have a question or not through raising your hand or by chat. Um, speaking of chat, if you have any technical issues, if you're online, um, please text Stan U. Stan, I don't know if people can see you, but maybe you can wave. Stan? You're going to message on the stat chat, right? That makes a lot more sense. This is one of those hybrid hiccups that I, I signaled earlier. Um, and then one last thing, just to note, this, this event is recorded um, and going to be published on our, our YouTube channel, the Canadian Centre for the Study Cooperatives YouTube channel. Um, if you prefer not to have your face on that recording, you should kind of, again, turn your screen off, turn your video off, um, and change your name on your Zoom signature so that you remain anonymous. So that's important to know if you don't want to be part of this recording. So with that, welcome to all of you here in person, and I'm going to hand things over to Josh. He's going to talk to us about um, where, he's, where he's taken his career. Josh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark andre um, It's great to be here. Thank you, folks, for coming in person. We have a few folks here. I know we're, we're slowly moving into that hybrid and more people in person type of model. And thanks for those folks who've come online. Um, hi, Mom, if you're online. I, I did trim my beard, for so Mom should be happy about that. You guys can see it was a bit long there. Um, so... Uh, happy to be here with you folks. My name's Josh Campbell. What you'll hear today is a story of how a young rabble rouser, I had a different word, but Mark andre said I had to keep it clean, um, how a young rabble rouser from Alberta found his vocation as a result of being sent to a boarding school in the middle of the Saskatchewan prairies. So how this lecture came about is kind of nepotism a little bit, actually. Um, I... Uh, I was pitching this idea of an agronomic university to my alma mater, Notre Dame, and uh, to a board member, and I wanted to have a, a mock pitch meeting with some of my buddies. So I, Mark andre was one of those characters, and he actually, afterwards he said, you know, I would make a great McPherson lecture. And I was like, oh, okay, um, how am I gonna work this into that? And, and then I, he sent me the list of the people who spoke before, and I was like, wow, this is, uh, I feel a bit out of my league. But then he told me today that every second year he invites, you know, scholars, and then the other year he invites non-scholars, or practitioners, I guess was the, the better word. So I'll call myself a practitioner, okay? Um, so this presentation is an overview of a vision I've been working on and thought about for a long time. Um, from what Mark andre tells me, Dr. Ian McPherson was a passionate educator, just period, and also in the co-op sector, and I'm grateful to be asked to speak in an event in honor of his name. Okay, so, um, this, folks, is, uh, <laughs> there's Will Cox, okay, there's, uh, there's the hockey rink back there, does this laser work? Oh, yeah. 
okay? So it's kind of back in that area. This is an, a plot of land that's 40 acres that I was like, well, what, what would I do with these 40 acres if I had the opportunity to build uh, an agronomic university? And that, that was kind of where some of this vision started. And I even had some conversations with the president of Notre Dame about this a couple years ago. And uh, it just was, it, it just was uh, hypothetical at the time. So what I do want to say, though, is that Regina and Wilcox are located on Treaty 4 territory. Uh, for millennia, people such as the Cree Assiniboine and Soto have cared and nurtured this land. I'd like to acknowledge the influence of their ways of life and how learning from generous people in this region has inspired the dream I have. Um, I'm a settler who's been deeply formed by teachings um, that I have received in ceremony, gratefully, from uh, some indigenous people. Um, I'd like to mention Chastity Delorme, who's a colleague of mine at uh, Miller Comprehensive Catholic High School, where I now work. Uh, Chastity and I started, teach, or started working at the school at the same time, and I think Chastity was a little bit bothered by my constant questioning and wanting to know more about uh, indigenous culture, and, but also uh, she was grateful for that, and I'm grateful for her inviting me into her ceremony family um, out in uh, George Gordon's First Nation. And I also want to acknowledge George Longman, who is uh, a leader of many of the sweat ceremonies that I took part in when I was uh, going out for ceremony. Um, above all, I learned that nature is not a what, it's a who. And that's an important point I want to make, and I'm grateful for what I've learned from the people of Treaty 4 territory. Um, so a bit more about me. I'm from a farm near Caroline, Alberta. That's west of Red Deer, big time hillbilly redneck country. Um, my, uh, uh, I spent four years at Notre Dame in, uh, in, from 93 to 97. I have a hard time making my mind up about education, so I bounce around a lot. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Education, Journalism, and a Master's in Journalism. I taught and coached at Notre Dame from 07 to 09. I should mention I taught in Africa for a year, in Kampala as well, in Uganda in 06. I taught and coached at La Boldis, and I should mention I took my permaculture design certificate actually right here at U of S in 2010. Um, and that was just two weeks, but formed some of the greatest learning I've ever had in my life in that two weeks. I'll talk a bit about that later. I produced and directed an award-winning documentary called Sirocco, Winds of Resistance in 2016. Uh, I was a co-founder and former president of Wascana Solar Co-op. I'm a gardener and a chicken farmer, but don't tell city officials in Regina. Um, I'm a teacher facilitator of Miller Permaculture Club, and I started my co-op master certificate here, and Mark Andre's after me about continuing that, so I gotta keep at that. Um, I'm husband to Morgan Campbell and dad to Claire and Greer Campbell. So two points I wanna focus on are Sirocco Winds of Resistance and Wascana Solar Co-op. I wanted to start this timer here. There we go. Um, so Sirocco was a film about the occupation of the Sahrawi people by Morocco and how that occupation was being bankrolled by companies like Potash Corp of Saskatchewan, which is now called Nutrien. Hopefully I don't get mugged on the way out of here, okay, because I know Nutrien does a lot of stuff in this part of the world, um, and they are no longer purchasing phosphate there, so that's good news. Um, however, the film opened my eyes to the global fertilizer industry, and in particular, how 70% of the world's phosphate is located in northwestern Africa. Uh, this leaves a pretty fragile globalized agricultural industry, especially when you consider that Morocco, you know, may not be the most stable democracy, but that's my point of view. Uh, more localized systems need to be explored in order to create more resilience and food security, and so that's part of the reason I got into this as well. Same goes for energy systems. We need to create more resilience by looking at more locally distributed energy concepts. 
That is why I co-founded Wascana Solar Co-op in Regina. This kind of local energy production creates less strain on our provincial grid, and I'll talk a bit more about it later. The goal of my original pitch to Notre Dame, uh, and then I'll talk about a little goal I have for today. Um, the big one with uh, Notre Dame was to establish an agronomic university in Saskatchewan that is inspired by Peter Morin of the Catholic Worker Movement in Perry Murray, the founder of Notre Dame. Students would learn through work, study, and reflection how to repair their own communities. The dream is to spread the agronomic university concept as a model of building permanence and resilience at the local community level. So these were my goals um, in the pitch. I also want to give a special shout out to Mike Fotheringham, uh, one of my best friends. He was an early JSGS grad. We first pitched this idea in 2010. <laughs> A long time ago. We weren't quite ready and I don't think the idea was ready yet. Uh, Mike is currently the executive director of the Okanagan Indian Band near uh, Kelowna. Um, so I'm trying to get him back. If he's online, Mike, you know, maybe we get you back, okay? Work on this idea. For today, my goal is to talk about how the agronomic university, permaculture, and distributism is connected to the co-op movement. It's an additional goal today. Another goal is just to get you all to think of the following questions. Who am I? And where am I? And how are those two things connected? In other words, does the geography of your heart match the geography of your surroundings? I want to talk a bit about that today as well, just a kind of a personal challenge in addition to talking about my idea. So this picture is of our Lady of the Prairies, as she's called, and it's a picture that can be found in the small church in Wilcox. Uh, this notion of Our Lady of the Prairies has always mystified me, this idea of the provision of food from our mother. And, and I'm going to talk about um, this concept of Our Lady in more of an esoteric sense, as like Mother Earth in a sense. So I'll get into that here in a second. So... Um, Right here, folks, is the little church where that picture's in. You can see a couple students walking there. Um, interesting to note is this tower. It's called the Tower of God, and it was built in 1960s. Uh, per Murray, who I've been talking about, um, he was a fiery priest from out east, and uh, he, know, he was known to have a really bad mouth. Okay, So Mark andre said I couldn't use the S word today, but he would have. And, and, uh, but he was a man of vision and action. Like those things that Mark andre talked about me, the, I, I got a lot of that from this guy, and he wasn't even around. It's just the stories that were told about him. Um, take initiative. Have guts. Do something with your life, right? This was the messages that Per gave. Um, per meaning French for father. Per also was a bit ahead of his time. This tower has four walls. One wall is the dedicated to Judaism, another to Islam, and another to Christianity, the Western monotheistic religions, and a fourth wall to Greek philosophers. This was in a time in the 60s when Catholics and Protestants couldn't even get along. And Paris talking about these other religions, which I know is normal for us today, but was very open in his time. So his vision of embracing tolerance is a legacy that is carried on at the school, and is something I want to see continue at Our Lady of the Prairies Agronomic College. I understand that title it can be a bit troubling for folks, especially if you're not Catholic or people who've been impacted by the Catholic Church, especially indigenous folks and the church's operation of residential schools. I still choose to use the name because it has allusions to the concept of Mother Earth. Embracing the sacred feminine is going to play a vital role in the healing work that needs to be done. Um, given this, I envision a place of learning that welcomes all people who want to honor Mother Earth, whether they follow a religious tradition or not. While Per drew deeply from the Catholic tradition, he always spoke of the primacy of the spiritual and the greatness of ideas. I share this, and I subscribe to a small c Catholicism, which means universal. So we come to the problem, which is probably obvious to us, um, our climate's in peril, global heating, mass extinction. 
food insecurity, eco-anxiety amongst young people. Um, and then again, we see here that Saskatchewan has a dubious reputation for being amongst the worst emitters in the world per capita. So we're 250% above the Canadian national average, and we are over twice the worst per capita country in the world, where the World Cup is being staged right now, Qatar. Um, so we have a responsibility here, even if it's just a small smidgen on the total scale of greenhouse gas emissions per capita, it's quite large, and we need to consider that. Um, climate change will likely disrupt our current global economy. We've seen examples of this through historic drought threatening trade in Europe this past summer. How do we educate people for a world where things like this are going to be a regular occurrence? And again, I'm sorry about how it's showing up there. It doesn't show up like that on my slides, but um, hopefully you still can see and make it out. So problem in education, I think the two are connected, the climate and the education problems. Um, a few years ago, I taught a grade 10 science course at Miller Comprehensive Catholic High School. One of the four major units from that course's curriculum is climate and ecosystem dynamics. For that unit, I had students go through an online course called Think Resilience. The responses speak to the need for a different kind of education that is needed to address our current situation. These are answers, varied answers from different students, and they form the reason why I want to look at an alternative form of education. So here's the question I asked, and it was also on the poster. Given what you've learned so far about the challenges currently facing humanity and the need to build community resilience, how would you have liked your childhood education to be different? I'd love to ask that question just even to people in this room if we had time. Um, Brooke said, I would have liked to be educated with more knowledge about what we can do to help our world. William said, I would have liked an education that would help me live in the natural world, such as living in nature or farming. Rahul said, we need to be more active in what we learn. We need to learn both physically and mentally. RJ said, less classroom, because you don't learn things by sitting. You learn things by being hands-on with the subject. And finally, Derek, Riley, Fazil, and David, the education system teaches us how to join and depend on a global chain. A lot could change in the next generation if they taught us how to localize and to be self-employed. So, um, the, a lot of this presentation now is a response to those students' concerns. Okay, that's where I'm headed now. So, um, you may recognize some of these headings from the poster title. Um, these are the main components that need to address the concerns of the students in the previous slide. First thing I want to mention is just the problem is the solution. That is a common phrase in permaculture, and it, it, it's great. It's, okay, what is the problem? Let's look at it, and then we can find the solution. We reverse that problem, right? So that's a general concept in permaculture. So um, permaculture is a term made up of two words permanent, and agriculture. It gives practical tools on how to help our world by living in harmony with nature. Um, Jeff Lawton, who is one of the, uh, I guess, well, more well-known permaculture teachers, he's quoted as saying, it's a system of design that, brings, that provides all the needs for humanity in a way that benefits the environment. So I'll talk a little bit more about permaculture later. I'm not going to get into the weeds of it, though. Um, then the next thing here I want to mention is works and study balance. So this is from Peter Morin, who I'll talk about again soon. He talked about the four-hour day. Four hours for work, four hours for study and reflection. Localization and subsidiarity. Government should be as small as possible and only as big as necessary. Politics should be kept to the local level whenever possible. So that's addressing Derek Ayal's concern. Then we look at distributism. Um, an ownership economy, distributism favors a society of owners where property belongs to the many rather than the few. So as an example of possible solutions, I want to talk about a brewery. 
near my school and my house. Okay, it's called multinational. I took my students on a tour. And yes, I asked permission for my principal. I think she might be on the call too. So, um, And uh, it was really cool. So this is a brewery that opened in 2016. And it's literally transformed our neighborhood. So I live in the same neighborhood as this brewery. And so is the school where I teach. Um, Heritage is an inner city neighborhood. Um, just to describe it a little bit, there's a main roadway in Regina that kind of separates Heritage in two. South of that roadway is a more affluent part of the neighborhood, and north of that is quite a non-affluent part of the neighborhood. So this is in the more affluent part of the neighborhood. Um, it's a neighborhood in transition. I'm sure you can relate to uh, different probably neighborhoods here in Saskatoon. So I took my students on a tour, and uh, one of my... The, the, the brewery is owned by four friends of mine who actually live in the neighborhood as well. Um, so the, the one owner talked with the students and talked about the product and how they got the grain and barley from Saskatchewan and you know where they made it right on site. The means for production are right there in the, in the building. And, uh, and one of my really bright students, her name's Bailey, she puts her hand up grade nine, and she says, uh, uh, sir, uh, why don't you expand? Like, this is a great product. Like, why aren't you, you know, reaching more markets? And he said something I won't never forget, and it really summarizes a lot of these points I'm going to try to make. And he said, you know, I could. I could do that. But when I give someone a beer, I love to see the look on their face when they drink the beer and they put it down. And I love that I live in this neighborhood and that I can have more time with my family and more time with my friends. I love that. And so I'm good. I'm content. And we're walking back to the school. It's a block. And that student comes up to me. And she says, Mr. Campbell, I don't get it. Why wouldn't you grow? Why wouldn't you make more money? I don't understand. And it just showed me that we are swimming in this sea of unregulated capitalism that really promotes that kind of thinking that grow, 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 grow. And the, there's not sufficiency in, in, uh, in that kind of dominant paradigm that's in our culture. And, it, and I know it because it's getting into grade nine kids to the point where they can't even understand someone who just says, I'm content with what I, I have enough, I need to make money, yes, but I'm good, right? And so um, this, this brewery has transformed my neighborhood, literally. Um, in 2016, the Saskatchewan government actually uh, put in some policy that, that made it a lot easier for microbreweries to succeed, which is, just shows you in policy, there's really important things that can help there. And so this was, this was started they paid people well, living wages, so those pay people didn't turn over. They stayed, and they became part of our community. Some of the people moved into the neighborhood because they got to know people, and then some of those people started other businesses, which I'm going to talk about as well, and it's literally transformed our neighborhood. And so you'll see here, when determining a number of economic activities in a community comes from small businesses, generally family-owned, a certain mood or attitude of mind begins to enhance the whole community. Um, that's by Professor Doug Fox. And I'm going to talk a bit more about him later. But just, I was talking with some colleagues. One of my colleagues is from Montreal. Um, and we were talking the other day about how in Quebec, there's just so a lot less franchises and a lot more independent uh, businesses in Quebec and how that, that there's just a different culture in those places and how in the prairies, you know, there's a lot more of those box stores, franchises, those kind of things. And I really think that is impacting us and, and is something we really need to look at. So this may seem really simple, but I think it's a big part of the answer is exactly what's happening with these kind of places and that and this kind of gets into the whole idea of distributism. So could it be that the climate catastrophe that we talked about is inextricably 
linked to the social one we're also experiencing, right? And how do we teach young people to replicate this kind of model and rejuvenate our communities? So um, you got to love a good old road hockey tournament, right? Like this is, this is one of the businesses that then started as a result of multinational. It's a vegan restaurant called the Hampton Hub. And they've, they've held these two fundraisers around road hockey tournaments in our neighborhood. And it's so, it's, it's funny but sad. Like people will drive by or walk by and they'll be like, this is so awesome you guys are doing this. And it makes me sad because it's like that people even think that this is cool is like a sign of how bad we are in community. You guys know what I mean? Like we've, we've reached a point where this is a surprise to people, right? And, and so, I mean, another little story. I have two buddies from BC, and they might be on here too, um, live in Vernon or in, I think, Comox, Vancouver Island. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, so nice in BC. They came to visit me. They can't wait to come back because we spend a weekend just hanging out in my neighborhood. And they're like, man, we don't have this kind of community back home. And I was like, yeah, Regina. Whoop. Okay. Um, so anyways, you can see this quote up there. I don't know where it went, um, but I'll just read it to you anyways. So um, this is a, a quote, actually. Uh, recently, I had my grade 11 students complete an assignment where they picked quotes from Pope Francis's encyclical entitled Laudato Si. So I teach religion as well as science, okay? And connected them to a series that I teach called Return to Eden. So here's one of the quotes that one of the group students, uh, of my group of students chose. So we're faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental, okay? So this is where I want to go with the idea of the agronomic university. This next slide is just um, talking about the, uh, the agronomic university as a concept. Hopefully I can get it to work here. Yeah. So... Um, This will also kind of dovetail into those questions of who I am and where I am at as well. Um, so the agronomic university started with uh, a Frenchman named Peter Morin. Um, he actually originally came to Saskatchewan and then the uh, person that he was homesteading with passed away and he moved down to the States and that's where he met Dorothy Day. Some of you may have heard of Dorothy Day She's the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement that is, uh, <laughs> well, it's, it, it's interesting because Dorothy's cause for sainthood is being discussed, but she's such a polarizing figure in the church because she was a huge anti-war activist. And uh, it, she, there's even times in World War II when they would have drills and she would just take people and have a picnic in, you know, in the park and get arrested because she just thought drills were stupid. Um, so she was quite an activist type, but also, I mean, she had quite strong roots in, in the Marxist uh, movement, and then she converted to Catholicism. And a lot of her interest in, uh, in uh, she would say her mentor was Peter Morin, this simple Frenchman who had these great ideas about an agronomic university. So. The Agronomic University would be a place not only to study, but also to work and build practical skills. Um, Peter Morin called the Green Revolution, not to be confused with the industrial Green Revolution. Um, he placed emphasis on mind, body, and spirit, or as he called it, the three C's, cult, culture, and cultivation, which he translated as prayer, study, and reflection. He was inspired by folk schools in Europe, the Irish monastic movement, and philosophers like Peter Kropotkin. One part that I want to focus on here is Peter's reference to the Irish monastic movement. Morin wanted a green revolution inspired by the Irish monks of the Middle Ages, who, in the words of the author Thomas Cahill, saved civilization through centers of hospitality and agricultural schools in the European monasteries they established. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, 
but because the Roman Empire never reached Ireland, the Irish Church developed an organization largely free from papal influence and characterized by the proliferation of monasteries. These monasteries were learning centers for not only monks, but also members of the community at large. Moran believed that it was the Irish monastic emphasis on a balance of work, recreation, study, and reflection that is needed again today. In one of the only voice recordings we have, Moran scolded people of Celtic origin for abandoning the holistic path of education of their ancestors. So this whole idea of who we are, I'm going to talk a bit about how I have Irish Celtic background and that forms some of my identity and how especially we as settlers have really disconnected from our roots in a sense of place and how traumatic that has been for not only us but everyone because we've wielded so much power in the world. Um, I want to give credit for these thoughts to uh, Willie Ermine, a professor at First Nations University in Regina. And uh, I want to sh show you a clip where Willie actually talks about um, uh, this kind of loss of rootedness for settlers and how it is such an impoverished thing for settlers. And I, I watched this first as uh, part of a course that we had to take uh, through four seasons of reconciliation. It was a course that all teachers had to take in our division. And it, and it really impacted me a lot. So I'd like to play this clip and then I'll talk a bit about it. Essentially, we're talking about institutions when we're talking about reconciliation because um, if the ins I, what I usually ask students in different groups are, um, you know, what you hear in the news media, what you hear uh, from different uh, sources would be, oh, those poor indigenous people, those poor First Nations people in that community, oh, they're poor, they are Aboriginal people, you know, all these wrongs have been done to them, oh, they need healing, oh, we have to have pity for the Aboriginal people, you know, this is sort of the discourse that, that uh, it permeates society, you know, that we need healing. You know, some people will see this wall. This is, you know, re recovering from student residence. We need healing. That's why we're doing this. We're not doing it for that. Because the systems in the Western system that have been operative, you know, that have, that have been in, in place for a long time, well, I ask students, uh, uh, you know, I am a Cree person, you know. My mother, my father, I can name them, my grandfather, my grandmother, my great-grandfather, and so forth, and which land I come from, and what my Cree name is, what my attachment to the universe is, what land I come from. And I can tell you about my identity, and I can, I can speak Cree. I can speak my Cree language. Then I ask the students, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to tell me where you are from, where your parents came from, where your grandparents came from. And then at the end, I want you to speak your language. And usually, nobody can do that. And I tell them, well, who's poor in, in this equation? You know, who needs help? I can, I can do all these identity things and everything that, that, you know, about me, but you can't do the same. So the systems that we're talking about are, are impacting not only indigenous people, but more so all the non-indigenous non people in this country whose memory have been erased about who they are, who the, you know, what their identity is and what their connections are to the land and what their knowledge system is and what you know, everything about them has been erased. And they look at us and all these commissions that study how we've been impacted, they all have been appointed at us, but they never look at the, the impact the system has on other people. These people need help. It's, it's, it's not us that need help, that needs help. It's we have, to, they, they need an awakening about who they are and what kind of a knowledge system they need to study under to, that they start learning about their own, 
their own people, their nationality, their knowledge, and everything that has in what we can call inherent rights, got a creator given to the, to them. You know, uh, too many of them in the academic world are are sent into our community to study us. I tell them, go back and study your own people. You tell me who your people are. Tell me what your language sounds like. Tell me all that. Then maybe we can have a good discussion. You know, that's what I call reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That discussion happening. Okay, that's a pretty powerful clip. Um, uh, every semester with my grade 10 uh, Catholic Studies class, we do a blanket exercise. You guys have probably heard of it. Um, one of the things I ask students to do in an assignment is to respond with action. And uh, one of the suggested actions is to look into your own family history and your own culture. And it may seem strange to be like, how is that reconciliation? And it makes so much sense to me now. Because when we look at it, um, reconciliation is, if we understand who we are and we connect back to a sense of place and our rootedness and our cultural endowment as settlers, then we can appreciate other cultures more even, right? We can look at an indigenous culture. How can we even appreciate other cultures if we don't even appreciate who we are and know our own? And that's a conversation I have with students. This is a picture from 2003. I went on a, on a journey to retrace my roots when I was a young man. And this is up Mount Brandon, which is in the West Ireland. And you can see there's a cross in the foreground. And then there's a, a pre-Christian standing stone in the background. And I took this picture and it was like, that's, this is who I am. Right? I... I I claim that Celtic heritage, and I also claim that Christian heritage, even though I don't like what the church is doing a lot of the times. I take responsibility for that heritage because that's part of who my people are. And, and so this is a kind of a challenge. Part of that, and that cultural endowment is this Irish monastic movement, a balance of work, rest, reflection, right? And so I take that to heart. Um, and this is why I say this is quite a personal project for me as well. Um, I want to just bring up two books here. And uh, they're written by uh, Ched Myers, and uh, he's, who's a political theologian. I don't have time to get into what that term means. But, and and uh, Elaine Enns, who also is a political theologian. Elaine's actually from Saskatoon. Um, in Ched's book... Uh, who will roll away the stone, he talks about these, um, these movements of settler people and how they disintegrated us every time. First, we came from Europe, moved here. There's a disintegration of who we are, a disconnection of who we are. Then we moved, and when we moved here, we moved to rural communities where we still spoke our languages and we still lived with people that knew our cultures. Then we moved into the cities and the inner city was a further disintegration of who we were as a people. And we moved into these cities where you still can find in cities these, you know, the Ukrainian center or the cultural center for this group or that group. So there still is those vestiges remaining. But then the third move was to suburban areas. And that was kind of spelled the end of like any connection that settlers have at all to, to who they are, Right. And so the problem is the solution. Like, how do we, how do we reverse that, right? That's, that's one thing to consider. The other point I want to point out is a, a point that, I said point a lot there, Elaine Enns and Ched Myers made in their book, Healing Haunted Histories. And they talked about these moves to innocence, how easy it is for settlers to just say, oh, they just need to get over it. Indigenous people just need to get over it. That's a move to innocence for us. And another move to innocence is actually to abandon our cultural backgrounds and, and to scapegoat them, including the church, right? I don't go to church anymore, or I, I don't associate myself with the church because they do terrible things. And therefore, we scapegoat those institutions instead of owning responsibility to actually make amends 
in those institutions, to make reparations and reconciliation with in those institutions. So that, that was a challenge they made, and I was like, whoa, like that's a big challenge because I'm, uh, you know, bash the church here and there. And I was like, well, I, like I'm, this is part of my cultural endowment. Uh, this is something I need to claim and take responsibility for, right, instead of just moving to innocence. I hope that makes sense in that way. So um, how do we own our heritages with the good and the bad? and seek to take responsibility for making change. I think this would be a good part of the curriculum in the agronomic university as well. So um, back to the uh, Morin's idea of the agronomic university. Um, you see these rhythms, I call them, that were monastic in a sense. Um, work in the fields, mass, breakfast, lecture, rest, handicrafts, field, dinner, sleep. Warren must have been kind of a boring guy, though, eh? Like, where's the recreation here? Um, so, but anyways, um, then you'll notice here Kropotkin, who was a big mentor of Morin's, um, he, he talked about especially the point on local and personal initiative, which is something that figures big into his philosophy and Paris philosophy, and that idea of personalism, taking the personal initiative. Um, so this is an example of an agronomic university today, kind of curriculum in a day. Um, each day we woke up at 6.30 to milk the cow, feed the chickens, take a walk or pick berries, came together at 8, pray the office. Next hour was devoted to intellectual, talked about different readings, such as Alistair McIntyre and permaculture, discussed. After lunch, leisure rest, we devoted another three hours to engaging creation and our bodies. The work was varied, ranging from splitting wood, weaving baskets, and then at the end of the day, we played some music and sang. Okay, so there you go. A little bit of recreation. Um, so from here, I want I wanted to just give you an idea of what some models that have been tried. Of course, there's, there's probably others I'm unaware of. I do want to touch a bit more on permaculture, distributism, and cooperatives, as that's a part of the title that I said I would get into as well. So first, permaculture. Um, there's, uh, permaculture was founded by Australians David Holmgren and Bill Mollison. Really, um, it was a bit of a uh, taking from the best of indigenous knowledge. They studied indigenous cultures that had the longest longevity, meaning they, they had the most permanence, if that makes sense. And what were the, the values that they had? And they came up, they distilled with these three, care for people, care for the earth, and return of surplus, or what you could call care of the future. So these are, this is uh, a picture of our permaculture, well, some of our permaculture folks. Um, we're making jam out of grapes that we grew in the back of the school. And so, again, the idea of that permaculture is, do you have a specific place where you can... Uh, be sustainable, right? There's an environmental science uh, course that's offered across the province, but it's very theoretical. It, do, it isn't situated in a place or a locale, how you can really make changes in that place. Permaculture is that way. Like, take a place and let's see ways that we can create uh, closed-loop systems and, and systems that... Um, you know, don't have to rely on the external grid as much, whether it's water, food, or energy, right? So we're, ex we're exploring that. It's just a club. I've submitted a document to actually run a course as a four-credit curriculum course within Saskatchewan, within the Practical and Applied Arts. It has reached the second stage, so the ministry has to approve it still. Um, so I'm getting there. Uh, but for now, it's just a club, okay? I think we need to move education this way. Um, I want to talk a bit about distributism. So distributism, um, so these are stained glass windows that Pear had put in at the church. Um, you can see here the uh, different thinkers. G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Bloch were English intellectuals who built their uh, distributist philosophy upon uh, a papal encyclical by Pope Leo uh, called Rerum Navarum, or On the Rights of 
and duties of capital and labor. Uh, distributed on basic assumption is that a just social order can only be achieved through a much more widespread distribution of property. So it's not about redistribution, it's about distribution of property and the means of production. Distributism favors, favors a society of owners where property belongs to the many rather than the few. It correspondingly opposes the concentration of property in the hands of either the rich, as under capitalism, or the state, as advocated by some socialists. In particular, ownership of the means of production must be widespread. So um, one of the quotes that Chesterton says is, we should try to do, what we should try to do is make politics as local as possible, keep politicians near enough to kick them. Okay, so that's, that's the whole idea of subsidiarity. How do we bring decisions more to the local level? Um, we, do need, we do need larger provincial, federal government bodies to, to make some decisions, but maybe it's too centralized and we need to bring more decisions down to the local level of government. So as an example, um, speaking of keeping politicians close enough to kick them, okay? So this is a pool right near my house, low-income neighborhood, a lot of low-income kids use the, the pool. They were gonna shut it down five years ago. I talked about this with my students in one class, and, I, I, and this one kid comes up to me after, at the end of class, and he says, Mr. Campbell, I'm mad about that. And this kid never said anything in my class, grade 10. And, and I, I was thinking, okay, well, I went to city, I thought to myself, I went to City Hall last year and gave a speech on behalf of the co-op. Do you want to go to City Hall? And he was like, uh, what's that? And so we talked about what City Hall is, how you make a speech. The night, the, the night that the delegation was heard, I picked his mom and him up because they didn't have a car. Okay, we went to City Hall. Um, a bunch of people, more of the Affluent people in our neighborhood spoke, delegations, keep the pool, make a new pool, the pool is getting old. And the counselor said, well, what if we don't? And, and then Victor got up. And Victor stood up and he was shaking. <laughs> and he had a cracked voice. And he said, all you counselors with your summer cottages on lakes outside of Regina, how dare you think about taking away my summer cottage for me and my people in my neighborhood. That's all I have to say. You could have heard a pin drop after that. And you know what happened? They unanimously voted to put a, build a new pool after that. And two weeks later, my wife who works in the media, ran into one of the counselors. And she said, oh yeah, my husband took uh, one of his students. Who was the kid? Describe him. She did, and she said, that kid changed the whole mind of council. Right? Victor calls this his pool now. That's him cutting the ribbon with Mayor Sandra Masters when the pool is opened. Okay? This is the kind of stuff we need to teach young people. Because a lot of us probably don't even know how to access these channels. Right? We need to teach people how to do this. Because they can make a difference. And we're not doing it in our current education system. Here's another example of uh, two kids. Harley... On the, on the left side, um, wanted to speak to the police budget. And uh, he wanted to say, there needs to be more supports put into mental health, because I've actually experienced police coming to my home in the middle of a domestic dispute, right? Counselors don't hear that kind of stuff from a lot of privileged folks, right? Um, Sophia spoke about the environmental sustainability framework, and she really pushed that quite far. And, and this is just an example of how kids are, can really make a difference, young people, right? So um, I was going to show a clip, but I, think, I don't think I'm going to do it. Um, so that, that just shows how, you know, we can't take action. And it's interesting because our curriculums say citizen engagement, and they say all this stuff in the curriculums. But when you start to practice it, it, it it's become challenging at times. You know, I've been in compromising positions with my, my school division about having kids come to council, right? I'm not going to get into it, but just um, it it's, can be challenging. But we need this, this kind of education needs to happen. And that's partially why I'm frustrated and looking to maybe go with an alternative. 
Um, but we'll see. <laughs> so distributism, co-ops and guilds, cooperatives and other mutuals are the rock in which the universality and practic practicability of distributism has from its inception rested. So um, distributism isn't just about going back to the land. Co-ops and credit unions are really the urban industrial arm of distribution, distributism. In uh, Honorable Dr. Race Matthews' words, they should be understood as our acting with one another to achieve objectives that are unachievable for us in isolation from one another. So that's my hat. It's a little dirty, but um, uh, this is my family. This is the solar panels we had put up on our roof. Um, my partner and I went to a movie called An Inconvenient Sequel. Um, and we were like, Let's, we got to get solar panels. We talked about it before. We just couldn't afford it. And then we thought, well, why don't we talk to some other people? And so I talked to someone else and they said, well, I'm trying to start a co-op. And I said, well, let's do it. So we had a meeting at a local bar. And we thought maybe 20 people would show up. Over 100 people. It was a standing room only in the bar. And we we're like, oh, boy. Now what do we do? <laughs> And that was when our co-op started. We met in curling rink lobbies over beers. Okay? We talked about how we're going to structure this. Um, we got a lot of help from uh, Saskatchewan Environmental Society Solar Co-op here in Saskatoon. They're our mama. Okay? And, and, and then the co-op started. In our first 28 months, we installed 468 panels in southern Saskatchewan through our solar investment opportunity and group buy programs an estimated reduction of 150 tons of CO2 per year. Um, so those are other th skills that we can teach to young people is how co-ops, you can do stuff if you band together. Um, this is a bad joke, but these guys might be known as the fathers of the modern co-op movement in some regard, okay? Um, but Jos uh, sorry, Moses Cody, um, was a, played a big role in the adult education and economic self-help for economically depressed folks in the Maritimes. Um, it came to be known as the anti-Ganish movement. Okay. Um, Don Jose Maria Arizmendarita, uh, it's a handful, is the visionary who founded Mondragon, which has now become the largest group of worker co-ops in the world in Spain. Um, I just love the idea of Moses Cody talked about like Catholics originally just meeting over coffee in kitchens being like, how do we avoid the predatory interest rates of banks? Well, let's pool our money together. And then they're like, well, you know, our non-Catholic neighbor is probably interested too. Yeah, okay. And then they, that's where they started, right? It's just those simple kind of meetings. Um, so it's pretty amazing. I'm not going to get into Mondragon because I'm not an expert, but 95 co-ops I think they're at right now and how they use the credit unions to actually fund and start new co-ops and have that help and support. Um, down here is Conexus, who helped us with a startup grant, credit union here in the province, and also was the first host of our solar investment project on one of their banks on Albert Street North. Okay, we have a 110 panel array there with them. So again, the way that co-ops can work into the equation and how we can pass that on and teach that more. Um, I don't, again, I'm running low on time here, um, but I just wanted to talk quickly. This reminds me of the importance of embedding our economy and not being subservient to it. Um, I want to highlight a seminal work called The Chalice and the Blade by author Rianne Eisler. Uh, it refers to a shift from a dominator to a partnership system. And uh, you can see some of the stuff here. She, she uh, does a, a look in history and prehistory and sees how there's this shift that took place from uh, original partnership system where there was equality of the sexes and um, a, an appreciation of the sacred feminine and the goddess and how a shift in her, in her viewpoint to uh, a more, I guess, taker, male-dominated uh, dominator system. And I don't have time to get into it, but I would recommend, I just wanted to highlight her work because I think it's really interesting 
uh, as it relates to the co-op model and some of the stuff we're talking about. One point she made that I thought was interesting is that um, uh, the dominator partnership cultures is not an ideology, gender, or race specific. In essence, any human has the propensity to dominate other humans under certain conditions. For Terence McKenna, an American philosopher who praised Eiler's work, this was an important point. I don't see what's happened in the world as a male disease. I think everybody in this room has far stronger ego than they need. The great thing that Rianne Eisler in her book, The Chalice and the Blade, did for this discussion was to de-genderize the terminology. Instead of talking about patriarchy and all this, what we should be talking about is dominator versus partnership society. So could the growth of co-ops and the social economy be a sign of a shift back to a partnership system? And how do we prepare people for to participate in a partnership economy, which I know you folks do here. Um, so the market opportunity here. Um, so maybe gap your students who are trying to find a place uh, where they're going to spend their year off before they go into university. People looking for an educational alternative. Unfortunately, uh, my student Victor didn't finish high school. Um, I wish I could give him credit for what he did, like, but I can't under our current system. Um, people looking for a cultural alternative. So there are some models. This is Unity College, America's Environmental College. Um, he just questions, why don't Catholic colleges have agricultural programs because of that monastic background? It just seems like a natural fit. It's weird that they don't. Um, so I talked with him a bit about that. The other part to this that I think is important to educate, again, on that social crisis as well as the environmental, um, it's just that idea of the third place. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. But finding um, not home, not work, but a third place where you can go and just be. Do you guys have that in your community? I do. And it, it's something I think that's desperately needed. Not something you drive to, but something that's walkable. A third place in your community, a hub where you can meet and connect. Um, these, are, these are the, uh, uh, the owners of the Hampton Hub, named after American activist Fred Hampton. Um, this is another thing we can learn from indigenous peoples who, in spite of many colonially caused challenges, continue to practice relational community like resist and practice that. We're now getting a point in our neighborhood where our kids have other adults who know them. In this way, we're moving closer towards the axiom, it's the village who raises the child. So perhaps multinational and Hampton Hub can act as schools and the professors of my university would be the owners of those businesses in part. Um, just ideas. This was last night. Um, two of my students were talking about a project they're doing of converting an old church in our neighborhood in, in the inner city into a community hub that addresses issues of poverty in our neighborhood. The group came out of a class project that I took students through last year. What if students could just focus on such projects and learn other curricular skills through it? Could we not ask universities to consider community building practicums where people can learn about such things? Here's a concluding thought from one of my students last night. Why don't we learn more about this stuff rather than just quadratic equations? So, just about done here. I, I do have a bit of a timeline. It's a 10-year plan. This is just a dream, right? It's hypothetical at this point. Um, again, please note the picture of Our Lady of the Wheat. Um, Notre Dame was actually started by a group of nuns not Pere Murray, until 1927 he came. That's all you hear about is Pear. But it was a group of nuns from the Order of Sisters of Charity of St. Louis. I got to know two of them very well, and one of them passed away recently, uh, Sister Vicky. And uh, these were the women that really made this community and made it strong. Um, and again, maybe I'll just move on. <laughs> Um, you can see here, folks, the phases I have. It's a 10-year plan. 
And again, I'm trying to think of how can I connect land based to also that urban community, like what we have in our own community. That's still a brainstorm that has to take place. Um, so here's a quote from Peter Morin. We don't need to wait till capitalism has collapsed to lay the foundations of the new society. We can create a new society within the shell of the old with a philosophy of the new, which is not a new philosophy, but a very old philosophy, a philosophy so old that it looks like new. So again, starting now, building something in the, sh in the shell of the old. We don't need to wait for late stage capitalism to collapse before we start this important work. I hope that this presentation has not only explained my dream of an agronomic university, but it's also made you think about your own life. Who are you? Where are you situated? And just how connected are the answers to those two questions? My email address and website are above. If our visions align, then please get in touch. Otherwise, I hope this talk has inspired you to find yours. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, we are now in the question and answer, peri answer period. Um, are there any questions from my physical audience? Let's start here. John, you always have a question. <laughs> can, I, can I throw it to you for a question? Sure. Thank you for just a beautiful talk. Um, and it's really actually inspired me. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I just have a, my, always my burning question about sort of moving to the local and uh, really connecting with local is always the question of scale, right? And how some problems seem to me to require, and I, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head, but some do seem to require sort of a higher scale, um, uh, more coordinated effort at a higher level. Um, yeah. Do you sort of see certain kinds of problems as being solved this way yeah. and others as actually requiring more of the coordinated, multinational, global approach? Yeah. I think that it's a good question. Um, I think a problem, you know, a potential pitfall of distributism and this subsidiarity localism is that, you know, under our current economic situation, like maybe the big businesses will just profit more off of that, okay, you know, we want to support these local smaller businesses, but then it'll end up creating more problems. So I don't know if I'm articulating that well, but it's, it's like, I, there's an interesting book uh, that where an author, uh, John Madai, he talks about towards a truly free market and how like if we just put in distributism now, it's almost like the patient will die. <laughs> um, it's almost like we need a dose of monetary uh, reform and, and big scale change in order to set that kind of economy in motion. So uh, otherwise it's just gonna, so uh, I mean at some level this is what we can control but I, I agree with what you're saying um, in some ways, we almost need a large-scale government involvement to get to a point where we can reset to this um, more low-scale, small kind of economy. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Any more questions? Any questions online, Stan? I don't think you, you said there weren't any at the time. Uh, just a lot of thank yous. Um, some some. Comments here from Glenn. This is so very good. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone uh, who provided us with this opportunity. Um, and there is uh, another thank you, Josh, for this informative lecture. Uh, one from Susanna, your oppressor will never liberate you. Uh, I do have a question here, okay, from Brian. Uh, what do you think are the main forces or ideas that prevent the education system from evolving in a more holistic way? Oh. Um, I think a, a, big, a big issue, and I, you could probably see this in a lot of different things, like we are trained as educators in a lot of our uh, universities to especially question dominant narratives and to question powerful narratives and to um, expose our students to, I guess, the non-dominant narrative. And 
it, it becomes, I remember that talking about in university, this kind of stuff, then you come into the real world and all of a sudden there's a lot of this uh, top-down kind of this is how things are done in education. Um, that's a big problem. I think addressing it, um, like bringing certain people in to educate educators, like just as when they're in university, but later along is helpful. Like we've had that throughout uh, my time at Miller. Um, I think, you know, the placement of indigenous student advisors in our schools has been a huge educational thing, not just for students, for the teachers. Because, you know, obviously, well, not obviously, but a lot of we're overrepresented as white folks in the schools. So there's been a lot of learning happen in that way. So in a lot of sense, it's this, this movement towards, I mean, the Hampton Hub, that picture I showed you is a teach-in. Tiro, uh, the business owner, has teach-ins on various different topics. And, and like, we don't have enough of that in modern society, just like teach-ins so that adults can learn and continue learning. So that's, I know we have professional development opportunities, but we're able to come in and, um, and educate uh, teachers to be part of the solution. Um, administrators need that as well. And I, I know my administrator has really, I, I think from my perspective, worked hard on learning some of these things as well. But there's, I don't know, it's a challenge. And I, I, I could get more into it, but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I have a question I think builds on both questions. One of the conversations we had today was around metrics. How do you measure, you know, there's this kind of real obsession with measuring output in education, for example. Yeah. And is, how do you see that rolling into your, your future curriculum and how is that maybe an obstacle to getting to where you want to go? Well, again, the first thought I have is, is Victor. Who, um, by measurement of our system is a failure. And yet, um, there's a $5 million pool built because of his advocacy. Um, so that's not gonna show up on a province spreadsheet, right? Uh, <laughs> it's just so, um, it's so, it's so hard. You know, I, I would love to work with students like that and, and, and to bring them along. It's hard because I know Victor has skills that he wanted to get into welding, right? And you can only go so far in our education system um, if you're not numbers or words smart, right? Which I'm sure you're familiar with the eight multiple intelligences are only two of eight. And that's our whole system works on those two. And, and so those, those other intelligences aren't, uh, aren't accounted for. Again, is another problem in our system. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, it's probably I'll stop there. <laughs> here, we have a question here, then we'll go to the one online. How do we incentivize other forms of profit? that aren't just monetarily based? You know, uh, um, I talked about my friend who, when, you know, this, this talk he had with the students, he made the beer, and they're like, why don't you grow your business, right? Um, there's something there, right? About how do we lift up that kind of voice, you know? Um, uh, a voice that says, I'm good, I'm content, I, I have enough. It's not like making money is bad. It's not. It, we need it, right? But I'm, I'm, t I'm sufficient. I'm to this point where I don't need more, right? Uh, I've, limited, uh, I've limited myself. Um, and you're asking me, how do, how do we incentivize that, right? How do we incentivize that? Um, yeah, I think part of it is what I'm proposing, is an alternative education that lifts those folks up as role models and professors, right? As, as people who promote that kind of thinking. Um, 
and I didn't have time to, to uh, get in. Well, I'll stop there. But I think that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Stan, there's a question from online. Thank you, Mark Andre and Josh. Uh, we have three questions here on Zoom. Um, we'll start here. We'll try to get to everyone. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll make sure we'll get to you somehow after uh, the event. First question is from Betty. Um, this is more of a logistical question. Do you have a physical location for your school? How do you envision obtaining land and buildings? Huh. Great question. Uh, so I did chat with the Notre Dame board member. Uh, Wilcox is a half an hour outside of Regina. I probably should have mentioned that. Um, it's my alma mater, so I have those connections. I did, I did ask him for permission to talk about this, and he's like, yep, go ahead. Um, nothing has been finalized, though, at all. Um, I also had a conversation with uh, a university about possible affiliation so that there could be uh, some kind of credit earned for whether it's a semester or a year within this agronomic university program. Um, so I'm hoping that affiliation will help to, um, yeah, will help with that. So there is there is this potential site out at Wilcox. Nothing's been finalized. That being said, um, the, the urban component is really important as well. So that's something I still need to think more through is how do we connect it to that urban component? When I talk about the Catholic worker movement, that was a really interesting balance they had. Dorothy Day started these houses of hospitality in the inner city in a lot of places around the world. Um, and yet Peter Morin's aspect was we're also going to have this place that provides food to the inner city so that we can have that connection of urban to rural. So um, maybe in that way, having a connection that would be closer to Regina would be better, right? Rather than something that's even a half an hour away, something that's a little more immediate. I mean, I would love... Like, think about all the room we have in schoolyards just to do small-scale uh, agriculture. Um, but then again, there's all that bureaucracy of permissions and <laughs> run into a lot of that um, just, just to get that going. So I don't know if that, that helps answer that question. It's still up in the air. There's other potentials. Yeah. Sam, maybe we can take those really two last questions very quickly and we'll wrap up. Okay, sounds good. Um, we actually have another here, so we might not be able to get to everyone online. If we don't, uh, again, I will um, personally find uh, work with Josh to address everyone's questions. Um, next question. Many farms are moving to more automation and more application of information technology. Can we teach local sustainable agriculture with si simultaneously teaching about agricultural technolo te technology advances? Um, I think the first thing I'd say about that is I'm, I'm not an expert in that way. And um, I mean, my, my knowledge is more in the permaculture area, which is smaller scale. Um, however, I, I think we need to be careful with our use of technology. Um, I like to use the term appropriate technology. Um, Maybe just the biggest and shiniest thing isn't the better thing. And that's that part of that mindset we need to look at. Um, work in itself, this is another thing you can find in papal encyclicals, the dignity of work itself. Just to work is, is, a, way, is a path to transformation and growth as a human being. We just think about work in terms of what's the product, right? But work in itself is a transformational. Uh, in terms of our formation as humans, right? Uh, I don't know why that comes to mind to that question, but like sometimes technology takes that out of the equation and we need to be mindful, not anti-technology, I'm not talking about being Luddite, but um, we have to be mindful of what is appropriate. And sometimes the technologies actually dehumanize us and take us away from that dignity of work, if that makes sense. Um, I wish I had a more specific answer to what they were saying, uh, but I'm not an expert in that area. All right, thank you. And final question. I like this idea of the third place. How do we establish third places given the increasing attack on public non-commercial spaces in the urban environment? Yeah, 
Um, the commons are really, yeah, disappearing. But I think part of it is, I mean, you see um, government policy with a microbrewery uh, creating more space for small microbreweries to enter into the industry and the social capital that that created in my neighborhood. Um, so government plays a role in that, in I think uh, lessening restrictions towards small businesses, especially small social kind of businesses. Um, like the, the founders of multinational didn't plan, they just wanted to have a storefront to sell beer and then it just, it, it organically moved into this, <laughs> into this social hub, right? And, and another thing that I just wanna say about the third place is, is the magic of chance encounters. Right? We don't have, like, I was taking my students on a tour of my neighborhood, and I ran into two of my neighbors. I was like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. And, and my students were like, whoa, like, you know people in the neighborhood? And I'm like, yeah. Like, it was weird. Again, just like the road hockey, that's a weird experience. But there's something magical about those chance encounters that, uh, that are created because those third places have allowed us to get to know each other in another space. Right? So I think government policy, cr creating more space for that is a really important part of it. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Josh. This has been wonderful. You've given us a lot of food for thought about our place and their connection to our heart. And uh, I'm going to think a lot about this. And Dion and I have some ideas that are coming out of this talk. So thank you so much from the people here and the people online. Maybe we can put our hands together very loudly in person <laughs> <laughs> for Josh. Um, and thank you all online. Um, this conversation, this presentation will be up, posted to our YouTube channel as soon as we, we get everything processed. And, and feel free to share it widely. Um, and have a great rest of your night. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>